Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening. Good morning. Yes. <laughs> this is jet lag. Um, we've been asked to speak, each of us, for 18 minutes, which is quite a challenge for some of us uh, academics. So I will do my best to give you a gist of what I'd intended to say this morning. Um, as was mentioned, I'll be speaking about anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, and reinterpretations of National Socialism. There is a common tendency to view the Holocaust as a well-ordered plot in which anti-Semitism led to Nazism, Nazism practiced genocide, and both were destroyed in a spectacular so-called happy end. This plot breeds complacency about our own world. It refuses to acknowledge that this is a story without a clear beginning and with no resolution. It is for this reason that one finds it such a difficult period to teach. We strive to provide our students with a more comforting, rational, logical, palatable explanation for an event which would otherwise threaten to undermine our civilization's fundamental values and beliefs. And yet we know that would be false. The story has not been resolved. Its plot has not been revealed. Ultimately, the world we live in is the same world which produced and keeps producing genocide. In what follows, I would like to examine se several aspects of the post-war discourse on anti-Semitism, genocide, and Nazism. And of course, as I said, I have to do it in basically in bullet points. Anti-Semitism. Roughly speaking, we contrast two basic views about anti-Semitism. One which sees it as a permanent aspect of Jewish life in the diaspora ever since the exile, or even before. Another which views it as a political, ideological, or social phenomenon firmly rooted in the late 19th century, or in late 19th century European society, and by and large discredited, apart from in some of the more remote corners of Western civilization following 1945. The former will view anti-Jewish sentiments as a cluster of prejudices. The latter will stress the difference between traditional anti-Jewish feelings and modern, so-called scientific, anti-Semitism. In spite of the fact that with each, sorry, that these two interpretations of anti-Semitism have often clashed bitterly with each other, they have by and large agreed on the role played by anti-Semitism in the genocide of the Jews. The proponents of perpetual anti-Semitism are content within the framework of an historical interpretation which provides one with a sense of stability associated with any historical law. That is, anti-Semitism is a permanent phenomenon in history. Similarly, the supporters of contextualized anti-Semitism can also employ their interpretation as a tool for understanding what would otherwise seem to defy reason. Supporters of the traditional view of anti-Semitism come from two very different camps. For the Orthodox, Orthodox Jews, it is a given that the Gentiles are constantly threatening the Jews. For Zionists, it is often seen just as obvious that the Gentiles would always be against the Jews. But the best remedy for this situation is statehood. For both these groups, the Holocaust is an instrument to fortify their understanding of Jewish faith and history. The Zionists say that the Jews that, lived in, that had these Jews lived in a state of their own, none of this would have happened. The Orthodox have argued that the Holocaust proved that the only way to continue Jewish existence after the catastrophe was to go back to the old ways. There have been, however, 
interpretations of anti-Semitism which have minimized its role in the genocide of the Jews and, and the, or the emergence of totalitarian regimes. During the Second World War, German anti-Semitism was not often invoked as a major motivating element in the fight against Nazism, something we tend to forget. After the end of the war and the discovery of the death camps, anti-Semitism seemed for a while to be the key for explaining the barbarization of German society. But the rhetoric of the Cold War and its insistence on the similarity between Stalinism and Hitlerism replaced anti-Semitism with totalitarianism, followed in the 1960s by theories of fascism, which again were more interested in class uh, tension and late capitalism. Moreover, Jews who had been persecuted as Jews by the Germans and their collaborators had no time for interpretations which relegated anti-Jewish sentiments to a secondary place. Conversely, Germans who had lived through the period could not accept arguments which made Nazi Germany appear to have been mainly populated by rabid anti-Semites. Hence also the exaggerated differentiation made between Jewish and Gentile historians writing on anti-Semitism. Detachment and empathy also seem to be related to chronological distance, with the result that in recent years it has become much easier for some historians to view anti-Semitism as relatively unimportant in explaining politics and ideology in the 20th century, while calling for greater empathy with those whose own fate had allegedly been obscured by the overemphasis on Jews in previous scholarly work. Meanwhile, since 1945, anti-Semitism, like fascism, has become a term of abuse hurled at one's enemies, while not altogether disappearing, both as a private sentiment and as a loosely concealed public platform. We can expect that anti-Semitism may, may regain some of its lost influence, not least by seeping in from parts of Europe where the collapse of communism left the public open to the rejuvenation of all prejudices. Second part, the Holocaust. In speaking about the Holocaust, we may also begin by a basic distinction between the eschatological and the scholarly interpretation. Leaving the eschatological view aside, not least because I have no time to talk about it now, the constant flux in the secular interpretation of the Holocaust demonstrates that the Holocaust as an event, by its very extremity, indeed its apparent alienation from its modern context, has become a threat to our own post-Holocaust secular world. The secular interpretation of the Holocaust is thus, in some respects, more difficult than the eschatological. The religious strive to justify God, but since God's justice is inherent to their existence, their struggle is one of belief, not of reason. The secular strive to justify man, or man's civilization, but they remain men even if they cannot justify humanity. Among English-speaking Jews, and much of the non-Jewish English-speaking world in general, this event is called the Holocaust. It is a highly evocative term, of course, since it carries with it the connotation of sacrifice without specifying who sacrificed whom for what. Some use, some use the surprisingly more neutral Hebrew term, Shoah, meaning great disaster, and applied also to such natural catastrophes as floods and earthquakes, Shoah Teva. The French prefer the more precise term, genocide, which is exactly, though not completely, what the event was about. The Germans tend often to use the no less precise but more troubling term, Judenvernichtung, or Jewish ext the extermination of the Jews. More troubling both because it was exactly the same term which the Nazis themselves used, 
and because destruction of the Jews evokes a scientific, methodical, detached, clinical operation. Whereas an alternative term, such as, for instance, murder of the Jews, would have provided it with a sorely lacking moral dimension. A multiplicity of names for an event may signify a confusion as to its essence, an unease with its presence, fear and anxiety at calling it what it really is. Holocaust is a name which provides the event with some meaning, and that meaning has some general religious Judeo-Christian connotations. If the Holocaust cannot be given a good historical explanation, then at least it must be given a meaning. If it was mass murder, then it must be given some sacrificial value. If it was genocide, then it must have had some purpose for humanity, such as that the Jews were sacrificed for the good of humanity. Now, so to speak, one can turn to the details with less trepidation. The term Holocaust arrived in Germany in the wake of the screening of the American mini-series, television mini-series, of the same name. Judenvernichtung, as I said, is the term that was commonly used until then. For German speakers, the term seems natural, since it describes the event with unadorned clarity, not to say brutality. Nevertheless, it has the effect of creating detachment, both personal and moral. It has a bureaucratic ring, an administrative dimension, a military neatness. Holocaust is a sentimental American movie. Judenvernichtung is a detached, objective, reliable, scholarly term. The term genocide has the same clinical and precise connotations as Judenvernichtung, but while the latter refers to a specific group, Judenvernichtung, the former is more general. The Germans are concerned with the destruction of the Jews. The French have no qualms about calling the thing by its name, genocide, yet prefer to maintain their distance from it, not merely by employing a clinical terminology, but by connecting it with other genocides, because genocide, of course, is a more general term. In Israel, as well as among some scholars and artists, increasingly also in France due to the film Shoah by Claude Lanzmann, the Hebrew word Shoah is used to describe the Holocaust. It is free from any religious connotations. And yet, the very fact that it is often associated also with natural disasters or with spectacular man-made disasters makes it particularly useful within the Israeli Zionist context. Since just as it is impossible to prevent the volcano from erupting, but possible to move house to a safer location, so too it was, according to this interpretation, impossible to prevent the Nazis or Gentiles from trying to kill the Jews, but was possible to create or recreate Jewish existence in a way which would make fulfillment of its false aims more difficult. At the same time, one must point out that for Israelis, the disaster, HaShoah, is distinct from any other disaster and still predominates much of the political, intellectual, and cultural discourse in the country. The role played by the Shoah in the transformation of Israeli identity cannot be overestimated and can only be compared to or be seen in an uneasy partnership with the Arab-Israeli conflict a people who chose to call one of the central events in its recent history, the disaster, is naturally prone to paranoia, anxiety, hysteria, and manifestations of brutality. It also, either consciously or unconsciously, chose thereby to ignore or repress some of the more glaring aspects of the disaster from which it sprang into national existence. And now I'll just say a few words about that. Nazism has always meant different things to different people. For some, it was an ideology, a political movement, a creed, an aspiration, 
an explosion of hopes and frustrations. For others, it was an abomination, a manifestation of humanity's darkest side. There were those who viewed it as a hodgepodge of inarticulate nonsense, manipulated by a crafty, ambitious, and ruthless clique. Others have claimed it was the culmination of German history since Luther. Such interpretations of National Socialism are to be sure not innocent of national, ideological, as well as personal biases. Immediately after the war, historical essays were written by English and American scholars who sought to prove that German history had taken the wrong turn some 400 years before Hitler, making the final emergence of Nazism only a matter of time. In the Federal Republic of Germany, attempts were made at the time to understand how it could have happened to the nation of Goethe and Schiller, and theories were promulgated that Nazism was the equivalent of a foreign conquest by a group of gangsters. A more profound trend in the analysis of the origins of National Socialism developed in the 1960s, where serious attempts were made to link Nazism to earlier periods in German history, and especially to the late 19th century, or in some cases, to the birth and development of German nationalism some hundred years earlier. The attention turned back to the regime itself in the 1970s. Here one might note two major clusters of interpretations those known, and which I won't talk about here, intentionalism and structuralism. Intention and structure, similarity and uniqueness, these are issues of crucial importance to all parties involved in the debate over the nature and implications of Nazism. Yet they are slippery concepts, whose clarification often leads one in precisely the opposite direction than that originally intended. If, for instance, we can show that structure played a major role in the formulation and implementation of policies in the Third Reich, and draw the conclusion that we have thereby diminished the importance of both ideology and individuals, we may find ourselves inadvertently also raising questions as to the nature of post-war German society and the extent to which the structures on which it was founded differ markedly from their predecessors. Similarly, if we show to our own satisfaction that the Third Reich was just an evil as other nations, as other times, what are the consequences to be drawn from such a finding? Does it reflect on human nature or the nature of, the nature of modernity? on capitalism or imperialism, on totalitarian ideologies, or on Western civilization? Does it in any way alleviate the burden of guilt from those who perpetrated evil? The old debate between intentionalists and structuralists has lost much of its ardor in the last few years, and proponents of both have been moving toward a middle position. Yet some elements of this debate have, were lost sight of in the fray and have not been recuperated since. Indeed, instead of leading to a more comprehensive analysis of the complex relationship between widely differing elements leading to a general crisis in Western civilization, we have witnessed the growing fragmentation, specialization, preoccupation with details, and reluctance to draw more general conclusions. It would be foolish to, to deny that there are vested interests involved in the different presentations of the relationship between the constituting elements of the Holocaust, as well as their continuing impact. <coughs> Germany is now ready both to detach itself from the Nazi past and to accept it, or at least a version of it, with less discomfort than ever before. Jews in many countries, including Israel, find this process painful, yet they too are showing signs of being ready to accept that the past is gradually receding from them. Scholars everywhere are sharing the sense of growing detachment and welcome it, 
who are searching for new and different ways of approaching a heavily researched area. Intellectuals and filmmakers and media people are still drawn to the seemingly unprecedented example of man-made extremity, but are simultaneously showing signs of impatience with old presentations or representations and are searching for new, ever more disturbing ways of dealing with the past. And let me just uh, say one word in conclusion. It would seem that quite apart from the causal ties between anti-Semitism, National Socialism and the Holocaust, what distinguishes them and puts them all in the same context is that they were extreme and yet characteristic outgrowth of the modern era. Late 19th century notions of progress and improvement were not wholly false. In many ways, the life of the individual has improved, but the association between material improvement and moral progress was based on a misunderstanding of the inherent nature of modernity. In the modern world, certain organizations, professions, institutions have immense power over life, over the life and the mind of the individual. Yet the power of knowledge and direction, though associated with moral sanction, does not imply any elevation in the quality of morality. Indeed, in many ways, may work in the opposite direction, since its legitimization is only its own power, the extent of its own knowledge, not recognizing any other limits and sanctions. In the modern state, the discovery of laws in nature, the enactment of laws for society, the construction of bureaucratic and administrative systems which would ensure the teaching, imposition and enforcement of these laws on the citizenry can be achieved with greater efficiency than at any other point in the past. In the absence of any binding religious commitment or authority, it is the makers and formulators of natural and civil laws who define the limits of our existence. And it is the, admi the administration and technical capacities of the state which impose them on us. We have nowhere else to turn, for there is no other sanction or institution. And because we know now the barbaric essence in modernity, its potential of scientifically and legally sanctioned and state-controlled evil, we enjoy our liberty and freedom as citizens of Western civilization with a sense of fear and foreboding. Thank you.